<laughs> well, go ahead and dismiss all the kiddos to your class. It was a beautiful state here today because we all have the Easter egg hunt in the back. Okay. You two get to stay in here with us, old people today. Happy Resurrection Day. Happy Resurrection Day. I want to give a big shout out to those that join us this morning on YouTube, Facebook. We appreciate you being with us this morning. Again, if you have a prayer request, please let us know so we can pray about it. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your prayers. And again, we thank you for being with us on this special Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's hold up our Bibles and make our confession. When you say it like you mean it, mean it like you say it. <clears throat> this is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. I can be what it says I can be. I can be what it says I can be. And I can do what it says I can do. I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My heart is receptive. I'm a winner. I'm a winner. I'm not a whiner. I'm a, I'm a doer. I'm not just a hearer. I said I'm a doer. I'm not just a hearer. In Jesus' name. The Bible says we're all part of the body of Christ. So turn to somebody in front of you behind you next to you and say, Thank God you brought the rest of my body this morning. That's my body. Now tell somebody, God loves you and so do I. God loves you and so do I. For those that have not been here before, uh, the reason we have hats on today, I had some surgery done, some skin cancer removed, and I'm waiting for my hair to start growing back. So I've been wearing a hat here recently, and, and some of the members of the church also wearing hats for just the support of me. We don't mean to offend anyone. I know a lot of people are raised, you know, wear hats in church. I was raised the same way. But we're just doing this for this reason, not trying to offend God. I say this all the time. I believe God more interested with what's in our heart than what's on my head. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want you to go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. The Bible said, Mary Hart doeth good like medicine. So I got you some medicine this morning. Remember these are just humorous stories, so please don't be offended. Red skeleton recipe for the perfect marriage. Two times a week we go to a nice restaurant, have a little beverage, good food, and companionship. She goes on Tuesdays, I go on Friday. <laughs> we also sleep in separate beds. Hers is in California, mine's in Texas. I take my wife everywhere, but she keeps finding her way back. I asked my wife where she wanted to go for her anniversary. She says, somewhere I haven't been in a long time. So I suggested the kitchen. <laughs> we always hold hands. If I let go, she shops. She has an electric blender, electric toaster, electric bread maker. She said, there are too many gadgets and no place to sit down. So I bought her an electric chair. <laughs> My wife told me the car wasn't running well because there was water in the carburetor. I asked her where the car was. She said, in the lake. <laughs> she got a mud pack and looked great for two days. Then the mud fell off. <laughs> she ran after the garbage truck, yelling, am I, am I too late for the garbage? The driver said, no, go ahead and jump in. <laughs> Remember, marriage is the number one cause of divorce. I married Miss Wright. I just didn't know her first name was always. <laughs> I haven't spoken to my wife in 18 months. I don't like to interrupt her. <laughs> the last fight I fought was my fault, though. My wife asked, what's on the TV? And I said, dust. <laughs> All right. Listen, if Adam and Eve had been Cajuns, they would have eaten the snake instead of the apple and saved us all a lot. <laughs> Amen? All right. Again, we do appreciate everybody being here with us this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege 
and the opportunity to share your word, your good news this morning. With each and every one that's here, and those that join us by YouTube and Facebook. And Father God, I thank you for anointing my heart, my mind, my mouth, my lips, and the words that come out of my mouth for the glorify you and edify your people. And I thank you, Father God, that you have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to believe. And I thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit this morning, Father God. And without him, Lord, we're just having a meeting with him, Lord God, all things are possible. And I thank you this morning for your anointing upon this place this morning. From beginning to end, I give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And we do it in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. 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 Matthew chapter 27. Again, verse 26. It said, Then released, but he brought Rabbis unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. You remember the story? They had the Rabbis who was a, a criminal, and they asked the people, Who do you want to be set free, the Rabbis or Jesus? And they said, Barabbas. And so they released Barabbas, and they delivered Jesus to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put him on in a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited the crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and in reading his right hand, they bowed, bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him, and they took the reed, and he smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put it on, ran it on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of sovereign and Simon by the name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, parted his garments, cast them off, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Father, that they parted my garments among them. And upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And they passed by, as they, as they passed by, reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyed the temple, build it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. It's sad to think that what he went through, all the suffering, all the physical agony, to me, one of the hardest things that would hurt probably more than anything was a rejection. Rejection by those that he was actually dying for. But he did this for you and I. When people say sometimes I don't know if God loves me, he loves you. He gave everything to show you that. He may not like our ways sometimes, church, but he loves you. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to read another scripture to you. So this letter from Paul, Jesus Christ's slave, is in Romans chapter 1. Jesus Christ's slave, chosen to be a missionary and sent out to preach God's good news. This good news was promised long ago by God's prophets in the Old Testament. It's a good news about his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came as a human baby, born into King David's royal family line. And by being raised from the dead, he was proved to be the mighty son of God, with the holy nature of God himself. And now through Christ, all the kindness of God has been poured out upon us, undeserving sinners. And now he's sending us out around the world to tell all people everywhere the great things God has done for them, so that they too will believe and obey him. Church, just after World War II, a preacher by the name of William Sangster came down with a disease that gradually paralyzed him. Eventually, even his vocal cords were paralyzed. And on Easter Sunday, his last Easter on earth, his daughter came to visit him. Using his stiffened fingers, he scribbled this message to her. He said, how terrible to wake up on Easter and have no voice with which to shout, he is risen. And then pausing a moment, he added, but it's even worse to have a voice and not want to shout. You and I should be shouting today, church. Amen. This is Easter, and Christ has risen from the dead. It's our spiritual birthday. Yes. Amen? Yes. But what does that mean to us here and now in this 21st century? In Paul's declaration, three times in Romans, 
He refers to the results of Easter. He said that Easter confirmed Christ's identity. Easter cancels sin's penalty. And because of Easter, we can celebrate eternal life. So you see, Easter has a lot to give Christian men and women. And the resurrection of Jesus is the very heart and the soul of the gospel. In simple terms, the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. His death is very important. But there were, where would we be without the resurrection? The resurrection was so important to the early church that it became their message to the world. It's a shame that today, in most of our churches, the resurrection message is only ministered on Easter Sunday. It shouldn't be that way, church. Every day is a resurrection day for yes. a Christian. Amen. Every day is a new beginning. He said, my mercies are new every day. Amen? Amen. Our message to the world should be the same as, as the early church. Jesus is alive. And we don't have to wait until Easter to tell other people about it. And for the Christian, Easter should be an exciting time, a happy time. Amen? Amen. First Easter gives us confirmation of Christ's identity. It proves who he is. Paul begins his letter to the Romans with a significant reference to Easter. He writes, Paul, bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of Holy by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ was the only one, church, that God ever brought back from the dead yes. to do what he did. Amen? Amen? It proved that he was the Son of God, who he said he was. Another question we have is, how do we know Jesus Christ was truly human, that he was man? Paul answers, he said, we know because he descended from the seed of David. You can trace his lineage right back to that great king of Israel. It's right there in the genealogy given the first chapter of Matthew. He was a descendant of a historical king, and as such, he was spoken of in Old Testament prophecy when it said the Messiah was set upon the throne of David in the New Testament. Jesus is even called the son of David. It's hard for our mind to grasp. He's the son of God, but he also is the son of man. How do we know that he was truly divine, that he was God? The resurrection verified it. You see, the resurrection did not make him the son of God. It simply revealed who he was. His resurrection proves that he was, he was after when he said, You are from beneath, and I am from above. You are this world, and I'm not of this world. Jesus came from heaven to earth. He lived as a man. He came to save mankind through his death on the cross. Along the way to the cross, he walked these dusty roads of Palestine, teaching his disciples and doing many wonderful things. But the days of walking along the dusty roads of Israel is over now. He's come back from the dead in mighty power. And his resurrection proves he's the Son of God. If Jesus had lived a wonderful life and died a heroic death, if it had, that, it had been the end of him, he might have been listed with the great and the heroic. But he would have simply been one among many. However, his uniqueness is guaranteed forever by his resurrection. The others are dead and gone and have left behind only a memory. But Jesus lives on, church, and his presence is within us. He's still mighty and he still has great power. Amen? Amen. Many have people have mistaken the view that other founders of the world religion claim to be God. But that's not true. Abraham and Moses, the founders of Judaism, did not claim to be God. Mohammed, the founder, the founder of Islam, did not claim to be Allah. And Buddha didn't claim to be God. Among the leaders of the world's best known religion, only Jesus claimed to be God. But what proof did he give? Well, I want to answer that with an illustration. If a police officer knocked on your door late at night, you'd ask to see his credential before you let him into, the, into your house. And just because people claim to be something that doesn't mean they really are. There's a lot of people sitting in churches today, but that doesn't make them a Christian no Amen. more than a car. So you stand in the garage makes you a car. Amen? Amen? He said, destroy this temple, referring to his body, and in three days I will raise it up. He said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so shall, the man, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He taught that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected and killed. And after three days, he would rise again. Easter fulfilled those promises that, and bear out his claim to be God. 
Church, we don't serve a dead God. We serve a living Amen. Savior. serve a living Savior that loves us. Amen. Some of you need to hear that this morning. You feel like you've done too much. You've gone too far. Made too many mistakes. Let too many things happen. Sin too much. And God just can't forgive you. Well, i got some good news for you. Yes, He can. Amen. 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 Let me illustrate how important it is that Jesus was raised from the dead. If you become lost in a smoky mountain, well, the undergrowth is so deep and dense that in some areas you might never be found, what would you do? Suppose you came upon two park rangers, both of them wearing the green uniform. The suppose one of them was alive and the other was dead from a heart attack. Which one would you want to follow out of the woods? Alive. The second result of Easter is that it gives us the cancellation of sin's penalty. Like I said, I want to follow a living Savior. Amen? Amen, yes. When talking about the righteousness of Christ, Paul had this to say, If the righteousness of Christ shall be imputed or assigned to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses, and was raised because of our justification. The Bible called the commentary puts it like this, Christ's death as God's sacrificial lamb was to pay the redemptive price for the sins of all people, so that God might be free to forgive those who respond by faith to that provision. Christ's resurrection was a proof of the demonstration of God's acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice. Thus, because he lives, God can credit his provided uh, righteousness to the account of every person who responds by faith to that offer. At Calvary, our sins were put on Christ's account. Another way to explain that, what took place, is to say that we ran up a debt of sin that we could not pay, and Jesus paid it in full, church. Amen? And this is what's so hard for us to grasp. Because of what he did, and you believing in him, you receive his righteousness, not your righteousness, not my righteousness. He said our righteousness is like filthy rags. But what we receive is Jesus Christ's righteousness. In other words, believing in him makes you right with God. You don't have to work. You don't have to try to earn it. It's a free gift that Jesus Christ paid the price for, and all he's asking you to do is receive it and begin to walk in it. Amen? The third result is Easter that gives us a celebration of eternal life. Paul says in Romans, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ may have also give life to your mortal body to the Spirit who dwells in you. What Paul is saying in this verse is all men will die because they're human. Sin came into the world, and along with sin came death, which is a result of sin. Therefore all men will eventually die, but the man who is Christ and his Spirit will rise again. You see, the Christian is one who is in Christ. The child of God is on his way to eternal life. Death is only a brief interlude that, that we have to pass through on the way. Christ died and rose again, and the man who is one with Christ is with one with death's conqueror and shares in that victory. Church, every one of us share his victory. We don't have to win the victory. We just have to enforce it and believe that Jesus Christ done it. Amen? Amen. When the shepherd boy David knocked out the giant Goliath with a stone from his slingshot, he rushed over to the fallen man and taking the giant's own sword, he cut, him, cut off his head. Jesus did that with Satan. Using the devil's own weapon, death, he defeated him. Listen, many times God will use what the enemy meant to harm you, and he'll turn around and cause it to work for your good. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 2.14 says that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release all those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. It was necessary for Christ to die in order to destroy the power and the fear of death. That doesn't mean that death and Satan have, have been destroyed. However, they have been made ineffective. Through his resurrection, Christ broke the hole which Satan possessed over man. These bodies that you and I have will be put in the grave one of these days if the Lord tarry. However, the Holy Spirit is our assurance that our bodies will be raised from the dead. We are given the Holy Spirit of God as the first installment of the life to come. Church, we no longer have to fear what the devil can do to us. 
Jesus defeated the devil. Most of the church world has not grasped that and realized that. He is a defeated foe. We don't need to be running from him. He needs to be running from us. Amen. 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 Most of our lives are worth, oh, what's the devil going to do? The devil cannot do anything except what you allow him exactly. to do. Exactly. Amen. Jesus defeated him 2,000 years ago, church. And the only thing he's got working for him is lies and intimidation. Yes. That's all he's trying to do. Get you to believe what he's saying and what he's doing more than what you believe what God's saying and what God's doing. But once you realize, when the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's a process. As you learn in the word of God who God is and who Jesus is and who you are in Christ and what power and what authority you have over all the works of the enemy, you will live a whole different life. Jesus said, I come that you might live a life to the abundant church. Most Christians will live all the way that because we allow the devil to come in and kill, steal, and destroy. Amen. Amen. Church, all this goes back. It all started with the cross. What a piece of wood. History has idolized it, despised it, gold plated it, burned it, worn it, and trashed it. History has done everything except ignore it. That's the one option that the cross doesn't offer. No one can ignore it. You can't ignore a piece of lumber that suspends the greatest plan in history. A crucified partner claiming that he is God on earth. And church said, Jesus went to his disciples and he asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Today we need to decide, who is he to you? You see, he was either a liar, a lunatic, or he was Lord. Well, you have to make that decision. Amen? Amen. The cross, the bottom line is sobering. If the account is true of the cross, then our history hinge on it. If not, it's a hoax. But on that first Easter morning, the kingdom of death was repossessed and hope took up the payments. But even Easter has to start with the cross. I'm curious, how do you enjoy having your picture taken? Most of us run when the camera's flash, like a cat fleeing a bath, amen? <laughs> Pictures, they remind us of what we've not accomplished. The few pounds we resoluted to lose in January are still there in the picture. They remind us how our bellies are going down and our hair lines are going up. <laughs> Most of us don't like pictures. But today, church, everywhere you go, our life is caught on a camera somewhere. Yes, yes. Let's say today Matthew is taking some pictures of people at the cross. And all of us are in one of these three pictures. Nobody escapes his snapshots. And if we look through his photo album at the cross, we'll look through your face in one of the crowds at the cross. The first picture we see is located in the pages of Matthew 27, verse 32. This first picture is those who were forced to the cross. And I want to hone in on verse 32. And they forced to carry the cross. You see, Simon was a common Jewish name. He was a local believer. He was not a pagan tricked into church by a potluck dinner. He was a common believer, a religious guy. He was a church goer that knew that God would send the Messiah. And this picture, it only had one man in it. Simon, a man forced to the cross. And only one sentence announces his presence. But is he the only one in that picture? I doubt it. You see, some in this room today, you feel like Simon. You were forced to the cross. Are you in this picture? You see, I always said even a few times I used to go to church, I became a drug addict because my mom drug me all the way there. <laughs> some of you are forced to the cross. You're here because of family. You're here because the husband feels obligated. Our mother only comes because she wants to be with her children. Or a preacher who comes to get paid. Or some of you come out of tradition. It's Easter. You're supposed to be in church. Others feel like it makes their role in the community a little more polished. 
But everyone has a common thread that's laced through this photo that they were forced. And here's one lesson, church, we need to learn. Out of every one of these three photos, Simon, the religious guy, is the closest to the cross, but yet he's never changed by it. You see, the horizontal beam of God's love was on his back, but never in the rest of the New Testament do we hear of his conversion. Never do we see him run home and tell his wife, I carried God's cross. I guess this is what we learn from the picture. You can be close to the cross, but far from Christ. Amen. Simon is not the only religious one in that photo, Albert. But maybe some of you this morning, you feel like you got forced to come to church. That you just had to be here. And you're thinking, oh, I wish it hurt to get over with. Second picture. It's also a picture of the church goers. The religious hypocrites. The circus believers. That touched the cross, but never let the cross touch them. The second picture of those who were foolish at the cross. And you see this in verses 38 through 44. And there are at least three different, three different people in this picture. The soldiers, the crowd, and the religious leaders. And possibly you could be painting this scene. These are the people that make a mockery of the cross. Some people are silent. Some people are loud in their opposition. To the cross. And the soldiers make me think of us. The religious, those who claim the heritage of the cross, I'm thinking of all of us. Every believer in this room. The stuffy, the loose, the strict, the simple, the upper church, the lower church, the robe, the collars, the tie, the three piece suit, I think of us. We too were like the soldier. We played games at the cross. We compete for members, we scramble for status. So close to the timber of the cross, but yet so far from the blood. We huddle around the world event and we gripe, we gossip, we bicker over opinions. So close to the cross, but yet so far from Christ. What's interesting, both the thieves on the cross next to him insulted him. And we usually paint one thief green with innocence, the other black with guilt. But Matthew's paintbrush paints both of them foolish at the cross. They were so very close to the cross that only one of them was changed by the cross. And I'm going to throw this in. This thief never had the opportunity to probably go to church. He probably never had the opportunity to be baptized. But he saw who Jesus Christ was. He accepted the fact that he was the Son of God. Just like the centurion soldier who's there the day he hung and died. And he said, truly, this was the Son of God. And he said, this crowd spit on Jesus. To the Jews, spit of the non-Jew was considered unclean. And this was send a Jewish prisoner to his execution without a chance to have a ceremonial cleaning. Even the religious leaders, they hurled insults and quoted his own word that him. Their education and their pride would not allow God to die on the cross for them. There's still a lot of religious people that way today. They're so full of themselves, self-righteous. They go around with this holier now attitude. That's not Jesus, church. We all have to come to the cross. And the ground at the base of the cross is level. It means we all start off the same. Amen? But these religious leaders, they were so full of pride of who they were and so educated. Because deep inside, they thought the, the cross was foolishness. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1 18, the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. To the world out there, the cross is foolish. It makes no sense to them. How can someone die on a cross set so many people free? It doesn't make any sense because they're trying to understand it with their carnal mind, their natural mind. But those who are being saved, they've been born again, their spiritual eyes open up and they realize that the cross is the power of God. It's the beginning of our salvation. Amen? And if you're in one of these photographs today, let me remind you that Paul also said in Corinthians, the foolish of God is wiser than man's wisdom. If you're that photograph today, you don't have to stay there. 
you can move out of that photograph into another one. Outside of Prairie Grove, Arkansas, there are two prominent tombstones in a cemetery next to a highway. What's odd about these tombstones, neither one of these people have died. Their names were Strickland. There was a picture of a lady and a man. She was born in 1948 and he was born in 1927. Underneath, underneath their names are these big letters. Each stone, atheist. Underneath atheist for Miss Strickland was this statement. I care for and love many animals. Is that all you can say? And underneath Mr. Strickland, it says, I'm a very busy man. I don't have time for this. Could I suggest that's a foolish way to look at the cross? In Psalm 14 and 54, it says, The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Listen, there's no air in hell because God is the breath of life. There's no peace in hell because God is the prince of peace. There is no comfort in hell because God is the comforter. There's no love in hell because God is love. Hell is darkness because God is the light. You don't have to go there. But there's only one way to escape it, and that's through salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 First, the scary thing about this photo album is that all of us have probably been in these first two photos at one time or another in our lives. Out of these three photos, there are really only two categories of people. Two types of people that were touched by the cross. Those that were touched by choice and those that were touched by chance. The first two photos were by chance, but the last photo you can only get in by choice. And the third photo that Matthew took are those that were forgiven through the cross. You find this in verses 45 through 54. And honestly, this is the only picture that you want to be found in when Jesus Christ returns to this earth. No one in these first two photos really was changed through the cross. There's a lot of people who go to church. They go through the world of the emotions. They do all the right things. But they never have a change of heart. Listen, when you accept Jesus Christ into your life, it's not just joining a church, putting your name on a church row. It's allowing him to come into your life. You were spiritually dead before you were born again. You're separated from God, spiritually blind. Until you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And once you accept Jesus Christ, then you become born again. And the scales are taken off your eyes and off your heart. And you begin to see the truth of who he really is. Amen? Amen. In this third photo, all who understand the meaning of the cross. And these faces in this picture are the least likely candidates. These faces would not be found in America's most successful people. They would not be promoted on Cosmopolitan or Time magazine. No people in this photo. The picture in this photo was a criminal that was guilty. Back in verse 34 to 44, we see he used to be in photo number two, but it's the grace of God. You can hop out of the other two pictures. This criminal was the least likely candidate. A flat-nosed ex-con is asking God for eternal life. He deserves hell, but he gets heaven. Only Luke's photo album has a snapshot of the criminal asking Jesus to remember him in his father's kingdom. And Jesus granted his request. But why do we put such less value on that picture? Because in our world value is measured by appearance and performance. People look up to you. If you are well dressed and you drive a nice car, if you live in a nice home, you got big jobs. But in God's photo album, a person is worth something just because he's a person. And maybe this criminal had heard the Messiah speak. Maybe he'd seen him, seen him love the lowly. Maybe he'd watched him hang out with some punks and pickpock and prostitutes. Or maybe he just saw what he sees now and what the centurion saw when he said, Surely. This was the Son of God. What did they see? They saw a beaten, slashed, nail suspended preacher. His face was crimson with blood. His bones were picking through the torn flesh. His body was heaving for air. And this criminal says, Any chance you can put a good word in for me? And Jesus said, Consider it done. Why are we so uncomfortable with that picture? A pagan ex con and a pagan centurion saying, 
Why are we uncomfortable with ex con walking the golden street who knows more about grace than a thousand theologians? Why? Why don't we like it? One of the hardest things to do is to be saved by grace. There's something in us that reacts to God's free gift. We have some weird compulsion to create law and regulation that will make us worthy of his gift. Church, that's pride that keeps you out of this table. To accept grace means you realize you are helpless to save yourself. Listen, none of us can save ourselves. None of us can change the way we want, need to be changed. <coughs> Only through the grace of God. Don't let your pride keep you out of this. If a pitcher paints a thousand words in the satirian, the thief got a dictionary for it. Church, we're all uncomfortable with the doctrines of substitution and imputation. But when Jesus dies on the cross, did he become a sinner? No. He became a sin offering for us. He took our place. And that's the doctrine of substitution. It kind of help you understand it a little better. In Leviticus, it says God made him who had no sin of his own be sin for us. This chapter describes sacrifices offered on the annual day of atonement. The high priest would offer a sacrificial bull for his own sin and then a goat for the sin of the people. The blood of these animals was sprinkled on the atonement cover over the Ark of the Covenant and then on the altar of the burnt offering. Following this, the high priest would place his hands on the head of the second goat. He would then confess the sins of the people over this goat and send it out in the wilderness. As it went out, it carried on itself the sins of the people. Together, these two goats symbolized what Jesus would do for us. The first goat shed his blood, which was brought into God's presence to make atonement for people's sin. The second goat then carried the sin into the wilderness. Like the first goat, Jesus shed his blood for our sin. That blood was then brought into God's presence to make atonement for us. And like that second goat, Jesus carried our sins out in the wilderness of death. He who had no sin was made sin for us. <clears throat> he took the penalty for all our sins, church. Listen, when Jesus paid the price for our sins, he paid the price for our past, our present, and our future sins. If he did not pay the full price, that means he would have to crawl back up on the cross every time we sin in church. But thank God he paid the full price. Amen? Amen. Amen. In John MacArthur's sermon on the ministry of reconciliation, he talks about how this happens. How people find forgiveness through the cross. See, Jesus lived a perfect life so that his life would be accredited to your account and my account. That's the doctrine of substitution. All your sins, all my sins, all the sins of every, that, every, that we have ever committed was imputed or charged against Jesus account. That's the doctrine of imputation. Let me put it this way. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he lived your life so that he could treat you as if you lived his. Amen. Amen. Our sins were put to his account. His perfect life is accredited to our account, church. Does that mean you can go and live like hell and still be saved? No. If you're truly saved, you don't want to go live like hell. You want to serve this living Savior that you found. Amen? And that doesn't mean you're going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. We all mess up. We all fall. But you keep getting back up, and God keeps forgiving you and letting you continue in this race. Amen? Amen. 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 A lot of people get in their mind, when I'm saved, I can do what I want to. Go ahead and do it, but I can't guarantee you heaven's going to be where you're going to end up. That's right. Amen. Thank God he saved. Thank God he paid the price we couldn't pay. Amen. God on a cross, church. The Creator being sacrificed for the creation. God convincing man once and for all that forgiveness still follows failure. All I know, church, is he died to make room for me and you on that final family portrait. And we often hear, life is short, better enjoy it. How about eternity is long? You better prepare for it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Y'all bear with me. I'm going to share this story with you. It was Easter Sunday. I was so tired at the end of the day that I just went to the edge of the platform, pulled down my tie, and sat down, draped my feet over the edge. There was a wonderful service with many people coming forward. The counselors were talking to these people. 
As I was sitting there, I looked up in the middle of the aisle, and there about the third row was a man who looked about 50, disheveled, filthy. He looked up at me rather sheepishly and saying, could I talk to you? We have homeless people coming out all the time asking for money or whatever. So I sat there and I said to myself, though I'm ashamed of it, what a way to end a Sunday. I've had such a good time preaching and ministering. And here's a fellow probably want some money or more wine. He walked up. When he got within five feet of me, I smelled a horrible smell that, like I'd never smelled in my life. It was so awful that when I when he got close, I would inhale by looking away, and then I'd talk to him, and then look away to inhale because I couldn't inhale facing him. I asked him, what's your name? David. How long have you been on the street? Six years. How old are you? Thirty-two. He looked fifty. His hair was matted, front teeth missing, a wide old eye slightly gaping. Where did you sleep last night, David? Abandoned truck. I keep my back pocket a money clip that also holds some credit cards. I fumble to pick out one of them thinking I'll give him some money. I won't even get a volunteer. They're all busy talking to everybody else. Usually we don't give money to people. We usually take them to get something to eat. But I took the money out. David pushed his finger in front of me and said, I don't want your money. I want this Jesus, the one you were talking about, because I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die on the street. I completely forgot about David, and I started to weep for myself. I was going to give a couple of dollars to someone God had sent to me. You see how easy it is? I could make an excuse I was tired. There's no excuse. I was not seeing the way God sees him. I was not feeling what God feels. But oh, did that change. David just stood there. He didn't know what was happening. I plead with God. God, forgive me. Forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry to represent you this way. I'm so sorry. Here I am with my message and my point, and you send somebody, and I'm not ready for it. Oh, God, forgive me. Something came over me. Suddenly, I started to weep deeper, and David began to weep. He fell against my chest as I was sitting there. He fell against my white shirt and my tie, and I put my arms around him, and there we wept on each other. The smell of his person became a beautiful aroma. Here's what I thought the Lord made real to me. If you don't love this smell, I can't use you, because this is why I called you where you are. This is what you're about. You're about this man. Christ changed David's life. He started memorizing portions of scripture that were in trouble. We got him a place to live. We hired him in the church to do maintenance, and we got his teeth fixed. He was a handsome man when he came out of the hospital. They detoxed him for six days. He spent that Thanksgiving at my house. He also spent Christmas at my house. When we were exchanging presents, he pulled out a little thing. He said, this is for you. It was a little white hanky. It was all that he could afford. A year later, David got up and talked about his conversion to Christ. The minute he took the mic and began to speak, I said, this man is a preacher. This past Easter, we ordained David. He's an associate minister of a church over in New Jersey. And I was so close to saying, here, take this, I'm a busy preacher. We can get so full of ourselves. Lord, thank you for sending others our way. May we never stop seeing them as your precious children, no matter how busy or tired we become. Amen. Amen. My question this morning, church, what photograph are you in? Are you in a photograph where you were forced to the cross? Or are you in a snapshot of where you were foolish at the cross? If you are, then you need to know that God has a camera in him. And he wants to take a picture of you finding forgiveness through the cross. Amen. I want to conclude with this story. The story is a father and his son. The two were hooked in each other's pockets close knit. Mother died of cancer a few years earlier, and the two grew very intimate with one another. The boy grew up to be a young man, and suddenly was drafted into Vietnam. The father's heart was broken and lonely. A few years passed, and the father got a report that his son had been killed in combat. Within a few months, came a knock on the door. It was a young man with his arm blew off. Beneath his good arm was a photo wrapped in a brown paper. The young man spoke and said, Sir, you do not know me, but I wanted you to know that your son saved my life. He took the bullet so I would not have to. And your son meant so much to me that I painted this picture of your son. And the soldier handed the picture to the proud father. And the father unwrapped it to find a badly painted picture of his son. The father was a wealthy man that collected fine art. He took all of his Picassos and Van Gogh paintings down 
And he placed a picture of his son right in the middle. Years went by, and the father grew old and he grew weak, and he died. And there was an auction of his house, and people all over the world came to, to this estate auction to bid on these Picasso paintings. The auctioneer started the auction with the painting of the young son. The groan swept across the crowd, saying, Get on with the good stuff. Take that nasty, worthless piece down. The auctioneer at the door and said, Who would take the first bid? A dollar? Two dollars? Up from the back came an old gardener and asked if he could buy it. But he'd seen the boy grow up his whole life. The gardener bought the picture and began to walk down the aisle with the picture tucked, tucked beneath his arms. And the auctioneer slammed the mallet down and said, Sorry, folks, auction's over. He said, In the in the rear, in the wheel, it reads, Whoever has a son gets it all. God the Father said, Whoever gets the picture of his son and only son that was killed for you gets it all. Church, my mom was on an altar call. There was a pastor who was given an altar call. He was telling people, come on down. He said he could see up in the balcony a young man who was clenched to his fist, his hands on the back of the chair. And he started to come down. And then went back to his seat. And the preacher said, come on down. It's a young man, come on down. And he like he was going to come back down. He started and then he slipped out the back door. Months later, the pastor would call the young man's bedside in the hospital. He had a disease that he was not aware of that was killing him. The pastor asked him, what happened on that day? He said, when you gave that call, I wanted to jump that balcony, and I wanted to run and I'd be the first one down there. The moment that invitation was given, he said, the moment I started to do that, my favorite sin popped into my head. He said, I chose my sin over that invitation. I said, well, now you can accept him. He said, no. He said, the moment I chose that sin, something died on the inside of me. And he said, I can't accept him. Church, don't be like this young man. If you feel like the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart here in a few moments, I said, go now to come down. Not to join the church, not come to me, but to come to say a prayer for your heart so that God can write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. But I want to share this one last thing before we do this. It's called, Why Did Jesus Fold the Napkin? Why did Jesus fold the linen burial cloth after his resurrection? The Gospel of John tells us that the napkin, which was placed over the face of Jesus, was not just thrown aside like the grave clothes. The Bible takes an entire verse that tells the napkin was deeply folded and was placed separate from the grave clothes. Early Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and I don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciples ran to the tomb to see him. The other disciple out around Peter got there first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrapping lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lined to the side. Was that important? Absolutely. Is it significant? Yes. In order to understand the significance of the folded napkin, you have to understand a little bit about Hebrew tradition. The folded napkin had to do with the master and servant. Every Jewish boy knew this tradition. When the servant set the table for the master, he made sure that it was exactly the way the master wanted it. The table was furnished perfectly, and then the servant would wait just out of sight until the master had finished eating. And the servant would not dare touch that table until the master was finished. Now, if the master was done eating, he would rise from the table, wipe his fingers, his mouth, clean his beard, and would wad up that napkin and toss it on the table. The servant that didn't know to clear the table. For in those days, the wanted napkin meant, I'm done. But the master got up on the table and folded his napkin and laid it beside his plate. The servant would not dare touch the table because the folded napkin meant, I'm coming back. He's coming back, church. Be ready yes, when he is. comes. Amen. Amen. Give God some praise.
take you in church, but I'll, I want to give you all I can give you while I got you. Amen. Amen. Father God, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you, Father God, that fallen on fertile soil. Some of those who had doubts, some who didn't understand, maybe, Father God, this helped them understand the awesome price that Jesus paid for when he died for us. When he hung on the cross, when he was buried, and thank God for his resurrection. And I thank you this morning, Father God, for the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our minds, Father God. That we don't have to be left here, we don't have to be left out. That Jesus loves us, and he loves us just the way we are. And Father God, he's the one, I thank you, that he's the one that changes us, that shapes us, molds us, and makes us into your image. And I thank you, Father God. I thank you for your unconditional love. I thank you for the freedom to share. I thank you for your son loving us enough to come and die for us. And I thank you, Father God, ahead of time for those that accept you today as their Lord and their Savior. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you guys can, if you put on a song, I surrender. You can. If possible. 